And that's where Imam al-Ghazali is also very extraordinary, is he, one of the things that he hated, Imam al-Ghazali hated the sectarian mind. And the reason he hated the sectarian mind is because he felt this, the sectarian mind's sickness was it, it was provincial. Uh, the sectarian mind always focuses on one area or aspect and grabs on to that and won't let go. Uh, Churchill described the fanatic as somebody who wouldn't change his mind and wouldn't change the subject. And that and that's that's the that's the mind that Ghazali hated. And another aspect, because he was a philosopher in the real true sense of the word, you know, philosophia, the lover of wisdom, he was somebody that was willing to examine a question to its utmost. He wanted to take it as far as you could take it. And because he was willing to do that. If you wanted to talk to him about it, you better have done the same thing. Because if you hadn't, he wasn't going to waste his time. He did not suffer fools gladly because he had done the work. And he expected his interlocutor to, to have done the work as well. And if you weren't willing to do the work, he, he just he wasn't going to waste his time. He had other things to do. And, and so that, that's an aspect of him that's really extraordinary, is that his, his mind was very vast, but he was also, he had a large S. Um, he, he, he wanted to understand all of these different groups, the botanist and the materialist and, and, and the philosophers. In fact, some people criticized his book, Maqasid al-Falasifa, which is the ends or aims of the philosophers, because they said that he had understood them so well and then facilit facilitated their thought by explaining them better than they could themselves. So he, in turn, allowed people to have access to their ideas that would not normally have access to their ideas. So he was actually criticized for making the, the, the Greek philosophical thought easier to understand. That was one of, that, that was a particular genius that he had, of really being able to clarify things. So he says, if happiness then is, is knowledge and action, he says what's really intriguing is for the otherworldly happiness, it's the same. So whether you want worldly happiness or otherworldly happiness, they both are predicated upon knowledge and action. And he said because uh, people that don't have knowledge uh, are, are always pursuing things that will lead to unhappiness. Because they don't have knowledge. Most people, you ask most people in the world, uh, what do you want? People will always tell you means. They'll never tell you ends. They'll say, I want money. But then if you press it a little further, well, why do you want money? Um, so I can do what I want. Well, why do you want to do what you want? Mm, so I, I, I don't feel I'm having any constraints. Well, why don't you want to feel like you're having a script? Because I want to feel free. Well, why do you want to feel you're free? Well, I, I want to be happy. So when you get to happiness, it's not a means to anything. It's an end in and of itself. And that's what he was saying, is that most people are preoccupied with, with means and they've forgotten the end of life. Mm. And he was telling us, turn away from the means and seek the end. I mean, that's really at the crux and the heart of his philosophy.